Hi folks, today we're going to take a look at how not to analyze a comet's orbit. BP Earthwatch has posted a perfect example of how not to analyze a comet's orbit. A couple days ago he published this video titled uh, Comet 1770 Incoming, and he claims that Comet D1770L1 Lexel is coming towards the inner planets. So here's what he has to say. 5.5 year orbit going to go all the way up to today. You notice it, it goes out past Jupiter. And I know this is fast, guys, but let me back this thing down into the present year, 2015, and you'll switch your charts. If you use these JPL models, pay attention to what I'm doing. Yes, let's pay attention to what he's doing. He's using a two-body simulation implemented as a Java applet on the JPL website for quick look purposes. And it has this handy-dandy disclaimer right above it. And in bold, it says it should not be used for determining accurate long-term trajectories over several years or decades or planetary encounter circumstances. Now, both of those disclaimers are going to become important here. Already, what you've just seen him do is use it to try to project a long-term trajectory, not over several years or even decades, but centuries, centuries of time. And, uh, yeah, a planetary encounter, one of the most important planetary encounters, does occur almost right after the epoch of his elements. Now, we'll see that in a minute. Now, let's uh, play a little more of his video here. I had it at months so we could quickly progress from 1697. We'll get it close here, then you can switch this chart just below where I'm clicking to days, and that's what we're going to do. Let's, go, let's come in to September. 2016 next year that's when it's inside the inner solar system but we can spot these long before that if you've seen, watched our videos for the last three years on incoming comets from Enki, Ison, Lovejoy you can spot them much faster than that and this time coming through the close approach to the planet will be in late 2016 up into January February of 2017 but that's not the, the point. The point is that this object that's been predicted, no one spotted it yet. It's on the ecliptic. It could be very dark like Halley until it gets close enough to the sun. But it's coming in. It will be in the inner solar system for five months. It should be spotted at the end of this year. Okay. Now... Let's take a look at Comet Lexel for a moment. It is historically important because it is one of the closest approaches of a comet to Earth that we know of in recorded history. On July 1st, 1770, according to Cometography, uh, Gary Cronk's website, it made a close approach at a distance of about 0.0151 astronomical units. Now, if you go to JPL's website, and this is the same page where you can find the orbit diagram that uh, BP Earthwatch was just using, there's this really important line right here, which tells you the epoch of the elements, which in this case are for 1770 in August. So he's projecting forward and claiming to show how to look at where the comet will be based on orbital elements that are a few hundred years out of date and not accounting for the gravity of the planets at all because he's using a two-body simulation. Wrong. That is the wrong way to do things. So we're going to do things the right way. Now, if we go to the Minor Planet Center, we can try to pull up the astrometric data, but uh-oh, this is a really old comet. It was discovered in 1770 by Charles Messier. You might recognize the name if you've ever heard of, say, M31. Uh, that's the designation for the Andromeda Galaxy. It's called M31 because it is the 31st object on Charles Messier's catalog. He was cataloging galaxies and nebulae. Uh, of course, they didn't know they were galaxies at that time. But he was cataloging all these fuzzy objects in the sky, trying to make sure he didn't accidentally identify them as comets. He was really only interested in finding comets, and this is one of the comets that he actually found, but it's named for the person who computed, first computed its orbit. Now, its orbit was again computed in the mid-19th century by a French astronomer, uh, and that was published in uh, 1857 in this book right here. So here is the actual astrometric data. And you can see that it's credited to Messier here. And these are some of the uh, most uh, accurate astrometric observations of the comet as determined by this astronomer when he computed the orbit in 1857. He was trying to come up with a more accurate orbit for this comet. And uh, it shows here some astrometric data from June of 1770 
And then if you scroll down here, this is a scan from uh, Google Books. Uh, here's some data from August of 1770. And then on the next page, it goes from August to September into October. And this is the very same orbital, orbital computation that you're going to find on the Minor Planet website, or JPL for that matter. It's that orbit. It was computed in the mid-19th century, uh, and it hasn't really been updated since then. And they didn't even bother to bring in the astrometric data. So they didn't bother to digitize all these numbers. They only digitized the actual final output, the orbital elements. So what I've done is I've now digitized all of the astrometric data uh, that's listed here for basically Charles Messier, focusing on his observations since he was the discoverer of the comet. And his observations do span from the day of discovery until October 3rd, which is the last date used as listed on the JPL website. So I've got this spreadsheet here, which uh, allows me to put in the ecliptic coordinates for the comet and it spits out equatorial coordinates in J2000 which is what you want to use when you bring it into a program to compute the orbit. Uh, programs today are based in J2000 format but of course they weren't using J2000 format in the year 1770 so they were for the ecliptic uh, of date and these were actually ecliptical coordinates here uh, they're listed as longitude and latitude, not right ascension and declination. So you have to account for the obliquity of the ecliptic, you have to account for precession, you have to do all those things and convert them back into J2000 format in order to uh, compute the orbit, which is exactly what I've done. And I've even processed them specifically to the very moment in time that the observations were recorded as having been taken. Uh, and then imported that into FindOrb, and from that calculated the orbit. And the orbital solution shows a close approach. Uh, can't quite see it here. Yeah, it's off the bottom of the screen, but it shows a close approach at uh, 0 0.01511 astronomical units on July 1st at 1717 uh, universal time. And that is is basically in perfect in, in perfect agreement with. Uh, the orbital calculation from the mid 19th century, which is no surprise. But what this allows us to do is compute the orbital uncertainty as well. Now that we have the astrometric data, we can actually compute the uncertainty of the orbit and take a look at uh, where it may have gone after it was lost and why, explain, maybe explain why it's currently a lost comet. So we're going to take this into ORSA and uh, see what we get. So let's see what impact the gravity of the planets have. Now I've imported the nominal orbit as calculated from the original astrometry of Charles Messier into ORSA here, and ORSA does account for the gravity of the planets. But right now it's set to August 14th, 1770, which is the epoch of the orbital elements that we see in BP's video. So if we look at BP's video, what we see is uh, that it's an exact match uh, for the orbit that we see in ORSA. You can see it looks exactly the same and it will always look uh, this way in the JPL applet because it's not accounting for the gravity of the planets. So note the date down here. Uh, it claims that uh, the JPL job applet is basically claiming that the orbit hasn't changed in all that time. Couldn't be further from the truth. And they, they know that when they made it. They know that when they put that on the website, which is why they put this disclaimer up here, which BP Earthwatch is ignoring. Uh, but BP also makes another claim that goes backwards in time. He claims that uh, in about December of 1697 uh, the comet had a very close encounter and almost hit Earth. Well again you can't make that claim unless you account for the gravity of the planets and you look at what that did to the orbit. So what I've done here is I've integrated the orbit backwards in time and so if I play the simulation you can see the planets appear to be going the wrong way that's because the uh, the integration is actually flowing backwards in time. The time is basically unwinding here, and we're going to see what happened. Uh, the comet had a close encounter with Jupiter on the very orbit that brought it for its close encounter with Earth in 1770, and that close encounter changed the orbit dramatically and put it on that course that uh, brought it very close to Earth. That's why it made that close approach on that particular orbit, but not on previous orbits, even though uh, the orbit still brings it into the realm of the inner planets. The timing was different, and it didn't make a close approach to Earth. And so if we go all the way back to 1697, and we look at the situation there in uh, December of 1697, what we see is that the comet was nowhere near Earth 
uh, in December of 1697. It was almost as far as it gets from the sun at that time. So you can see the dramatic difference here between what ORSA shows and what a simple two-body simulation shows, which is what BP Earthwatch used. And this is over just a few decades of time. Now, BP goes on to uh, play the two-body simulation for, for centuries of time and suggest that this is still uh, what the orbit looks like and suggest that it's incoming, that it's coming towards Earth. Well, he can't know that based on that simulation because it's interacting with the gravity of Jupiter, which this simulation is not accounting for, and it specifically says, do not use me for long-term trajectories and planetary encounter circumstances, both of which apply here, both of which are being ignored by BUP Earthwatch, but he's trying to teach you how to use this applet to try to make claims like this, which is completely wrong. Don't do it like that. So let's go back into ORSA here and take a look at an integration that goes forward uh, to today. Actually, before we do that, let's take a look at uh, a chart of the close approach distance between the comet and Earth uh, from 1770 back to 1697, just so you can see. So we can actually chart the distance between the comet and Earth and see the close approach times. And you can see that the, the, the lowest dip on this chart, the closest approach, was in 1770. And that close approach distance was at about uh, almost uh, 0.015 astronomical units, as we saw with Find Orb. And that is the lowest dip. The next best encounter that it had was 10 times as far away, in about uh, 1739. So, no, it didn't have a particularly close approach in December of uh, 1697. That just was not the case. Uh, it was actually quite far from Earth at that time. So let's go forward now to today and see what the situation was uh, with this comet shortly after it encountered Earth in 1770 and see how the orbit changed as it interacted with Jupiter. So what I've done is I've used the astrometry uh, recorded by Charles Messier, converted by me into modern J2000 coordinates in order to get an, an idea of the uncertainty region. And this is not meant to be an exhaustive uh, display of possible orbits. This is just a flavor, just a taste of how important the gravity of the planets are and how important uh, it is to be aware of the uncertainty in the original observations. The original observations conducted in 1770 were only conducted over a few months of time. The comet was only seen from June of 1770 to October of 1770, and that was it. Uh, <clears throat> and that's not a very long arc to make an orbit determination to begin with. And to add to that, the equipment present in that time was much more primitive than what we have today. Today we can take a CCD image of a comet and nail down the exact pixel of the nucleus of the comet and measure it very precisely relative to the stars. They couldn't do that in 1770. They were just using eyepieces and making measurements manually. And so there's a higher degree of measurement error that's just intrinsic in those measurements. And so combining those two factors means that the orbit is highly uncertain to begin with and then you add in the effect of Jupiter's gravity and depending on exactly where that comet was when it encountered Jupiter it's going to have a very different orbit at the end of it. So again, this is not meant to be an extensive, uh, exhaustive uh, number of possibilities, just a few just to show you uh, how important this is and uh, how, how uh, much Jupiter's gravity affects the orbit and why it's a lost comet. So you can see that in the current era, this is now on uh, July 22nd, 2015, we have no idea where the comet is. Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? It could be just about anywhere in the solar system. But Jupiter's gravity has perturbed it over time dramatically and has now kicked it out and in deeper into the solar system. So the reason it hasn't been seen for hundreds of years is because Jupiter's gravity continued to influence it and changed the way that it encountered Earth so that it no longer made such close approaches to Earth. It was probably a fairly small comet, but it was notable because it made such a close approach that it was quite easily visible. But in uh, about 17, I think it was, was it 1779? Let's see here. Let's just play this forward a little bit faster here. Yeah, in about 1779, it had a close encounter with Jupiter again. So heading out away from Earth on that very same orbit, it has another encounter with Jupiter, which changes the orbit quite a bit. You can see how it shrunk there, and that's going to change the encounter time 
uh, with Earth, and basically we didn't get another close approach like we did in 1770. And by now, in the modern era, the orbits have already scattered to the point that it's probably somewhere deep in the solar system, far away from the sun, uh, and not able to outgas uh, like it used to. So it's effectively a dormant comet. That's why we haven't seen it in hundreds of years, and we don't even know where in the solar system it is. It could be just about uh, anywhere uh, in any direction, uh, but it's definitely not incoming towards Earth, as BP claims. BP didn't do his homework. He didn't actually do the work that's necessary to make that sort of claim. Uh, to make that sort of claim, you have to do what I did. You have to go back to the primary source material, back to the original astrometry, digitize that, uh, convert it from ecliptic coordinates of 1770 to equatorial coordinates in J2000 format, account for the obliquity of the ecliptic, account for precession, do all those calculations, and then calculate the orbit and see what the uncertainty region looks like. And he didn't do that. Uh, he didn't do that at all. BP Earthwatch and people like him uh, don't really understand how this works, or they just don't care. In any case, they're using a tool that's inappropriate for the job at hand, and the end result is they come up with very, very wrong answers. Uh, but this is how you actually do it. So again, I will upload uh, the Excel spreadsheet that has all of the astrometry from Charles Messier uh, converted to J2000 coordinates, and you can see the calculations for yourself. And I, you know, I don't expect people to understand the calculations. They're very complicated, uh, pretty involved stuff. But the point is just to show you how much work it takes to be able to make this sort of analysis and to make a claim of any kind about where that comet is, about where a comet that's been lost for hundreds of years is currently located, uh, or at least what kind of orbit it might have, and then come up with an explanation for why it hasn't been seen. Uh, so. BP Earthwatch gets all of that wrong, but I hope this has been educational for you guys and I hope you have a better understanding now of why you should not use the JPL Java applet for this kind of work. It's just not appropriate for that. It's only meant as a quick look tool to examine what the orbit looked like at the epoch of the orbital elements, which in this case is all the way back in 1770. So uh, that's all there is to this. I uh, hope you guys have a good day and uh, clear skies, folks.